Okay? Yeah. Okay. So um, this is where we were. The red stuff is the piatic upper half plane that I constructed in at least more or less as a rigid analytic space yesterday. And the blue stuff is the tree for PGL2 of the ground field K. And the, the picture that I wanted you to have in mind is that the, the upper half plane, I mean, there's this reduction map, which takes you from a point in the upper half plane to the tree. And I wanted you to think of this as, as I mean, I'm not, someone pointed out, maybe a tubular neighborhood isn't quite the right terminology. It's just the boundary here. It's this, it's this, uh, it's the tubes, not the interior of the tubes, which are the piatic upper half plane. So these are actual cycles. And then this picture here, this is sort of one of the standard affinoids, and this is the link of a vertex in the tree. And the relationship here is that this sort of big unshaded area all collapses to the vertex. And these intermediate regions here, they, they go to the edges as you go deeper into them. And then inside here would be another piece of this picture repeated like a fractal. And that would be the next vertex on this edge. Um, I skipped this in the talk. And I think I'll just indicate you know, why is this, where does this picture come from? So I have to remind you, I mean, the reduction map, you'll recall, I'll just very briefly remind you, is gotten by just taking, it, I mean, V star is the space of linear forms in the homogeneous coordinates on projective space. And if you have a point in the upper half plane, you just evaluate the linear form there and take its usual piatic absolute value. That gives you a norm on this two-dimensional vector space, which is therefore a point on the tree. And if you try to figure out you know, what is the inverse image of a point on the tree, you get the following kind of question. So you take the standard vertex, or the Gauss point, I guess it was called uh, by Matt, and you ask yourself which points in the upper half plane reduce to it. And if you translate the definition of the reduction map back, the condition that you get is it's the set of points uh, with the property that as t runs through the integers of k, x minus t is a unit. OK? That's the, con con that's the translation of the condition. And if you think about what that says, it says that x is in CP and it's not congruent. It's an integer in CP not congruent to a rational point mod p. And that's one of these punctured disks. If you if you take an edge, well, OK, this is the proof of that fact. If you want to see, you just have to check that that is, in fact, the norm. That if you look at um, when is it the case for which x and y is it the case that for a and b, the valuation of ax plus by is just the infimum of the valuations of a and b. And the condition there is that somehow, I mean, right, that's the usual case. The only way this can fail is if there's some relation between x and y which for certain values of a and b might make this smaller than you expect. And that's what you have to rule out. So that's the calculation for the, uh, for the vertices. And if you do the calculation for the edges, it's very similar. You have to say, when is it the case that the valuation of ax plus by is, I mean, it, this is what you would get if you, if you gave the valuation of x to be t and the valuation of y to be 0, and then you just Assume there was no relations between ax plus by, so the valuation was given sort of by the naive formula. And you ask yourself, what conditions do you have to impose to make that naive formula hold? And you end up getting this condition, basically that this is an annulus. So remember, bigger than 0 and less than 1 in valuation is the same as less than 1 and bigger than the absolute value of p or something in absolute value. So these are the two kinds of domains which make up the space. I should mention this is not an affinoid, but it is an admissible annulus. But the you might, I mean, it's an interesting uh, thing to think about. I mean, one way to, to make a covering of the piatic upper half plane would be to take the inverse images of the vertices under the reduction map and the inverse images of the edges. And that's a covering of the points of the piatic upper half plane because the reduction map is surjective. But it's not an admissible covering because um, it's very similar to the example that Brian gave where you take the closed unit disk and you try to cover it by the open unit disk and then the annulus at the boundary. Um, 
that's a perfectly good covering of the points, but not an admissible covering. If you want to make admissible coverings of the upper half plane, you have to take regions in the tree which kind of overlap one another and take their inverse image under reduction. And un if you do that, then um, the, uh, the overlaps regions in the tree, their inverse images will be big enough to make the covering admissible. So even another way to understand the tree is that it's the nerve of a kind of, I mean, at least combinatorially, it's the nerve of a sort of standard covering of the piatic upper half plane. Okay. So that's uh, the end of the first of the four parts of this lecture divided into five parts. So, uh, and it ends the discussion sort of of the geometry, the pure ge purely geometric questions about the piatic upper half plane. And now we turn to some analysis. So the next part um, is about the relationship between the rigid functions on the upper half plane. So those are those spaces O of K. All, they're all the same space. They just have different group actions on them. And um, functions on the boundary of the piatic upper half plane. So we're in kind of the world of the Poisson um, kernel. We're trying to, if you like, relate harmonic functions in the disk to some kind of boundary distributions, except it's not quite the same thing. But that somehow is the spirit of this. So as I mentioned, oh, so the outline of the second part, I mean, we talk, we'll talk first about the non-rigid kind of piatic analysis, uh, the, which is the doesn't ha I mean, I think the term that has, has I like for it is, is locally analytic piatic analysis, if you like, or the theory of locally analytic functions. But it's, the, it's the, the notion where you just, by an analytic function, just mean functions given by power series on disks in a naive topology. And that will be background for talking about the relationship, what, what I, I call here Morita duality. This is a... Um, a theorem that relates the functions on the upper half plane to certain spaces of functions on the boundary and exhibits this duality that I mentioned between rigid geometry and locally analytic functions. And uh, the, I should stop. I mean, I'm not entirely sure that I will quite get to this topic today, but the main application of, I mean, the original application of the piatic upper half plane was to generalize the notion of the tate elliptic curve to curves of higher genus. I mean, it was invented, I guess, first by Mumford with that application in mind. So one of the main things you can do with the piatic upper half plane is to uniformize certain kinds of algebraic curves. So normally, I think this would come first, but because of my fascination with analysis, it comes later. OK, so that's the plan. So let's talk a little bit about analytic functions. Um, so this is uh, the basic idea. You start with a point in, I mean, what is a locally analytic function? Well, what's an analytic function, first of all? You start with a point in affine space and some radii, and you consider the, this is basically this, the functions, uh, this, func this ring, A, L, B of A, R, is the space of functions on this disk which converges. This is essentially a Tate algebra for the functions on this disk, it just doesn't happen to have, they, they might have different radii in different directions. Um, and the, um, the coefficients here are chosen from fe some field L. So the function takes values in, in some field L. But basically, this is a Tate algebra for a particular polydisk. And this is the convergence condition for this uh, multi-index, namely that the, if you think of the x, this x minus a as being bounded by these radii, then and translate that into the convergence condition, this somehow says that the terms in this sum go to zero. And so the, the power series converges. So this, the building blocks for this theory are, once again, Tate algebras. There are these Bonnock spaces. And, and just as in the case, this is the Gauss norm on this Tate algebra. That is to say, I mean, it's been renormalized a little bit. But basically, what we're doing is we're taking uh, the, if this is the soup norm for this function on this polys. Okay, it's a renormalized version of the norm on the standard Tate algebra. And these are Bonnock spaces, and they're just, as I said, they're basically Tate algebras. And so we begin this kind of analysis also with the Tate algebra, but we then go in the, 
completely opposite direction that you go with rigid analysis. Namely, you try to make uh, what's called a locally analytic manifold, and you do that. I mean, I, I don't give the full definition here, but the idea is kind of what you would expect. You take um, a topological space which is covered by open balls in the canonical p adic topology. Uh, so these open sets are each homeomorphic to some ball in Kn. And then to give a locally analytic function on such a thing is just to give a covering of m by balls that's somehow subordinate to this covering and just give a power series on each one of those things that converges in that ball. Okay? And you can talk about charts and overlaps and so forth, but, but a, an analytic function on such a space is, is basically given by a collection of power series. And since this is the opposite of rigid analysis, there's no compatibility conditions required. I mean, if you choose, if you, re, if you refine your covering, uh, and you can then choose functions at random on the subcovering. So I mean, locally constant functions, for example, are perfectly good analytic functions on these locally analytic manifolds. Okay, so that that sort of shows you that you're at there. These spaces are not connected in any sense. Yeah, L should be fixed, and I'm sorry about th th this. Is actually these are the L val the manifold is defined over K, and these are the L valued functions on it. So that's how, what I've really defined here is the L valued analytic functions on an analytic manifold defined over K. Now, the, um, the interesting thing about these spaces is, is to look then at their kind of global space of, of locally analytic functions. And, and so if you think about all the locally analytic functions on such a space, I mean, you can take arbitrary, arbitrarily small, I mean, think about if you like, just. Uh, just start with the unit ball again, but think about locally analytic functions on it. So you cover this ball by a whole bunch of small subballs, and you specify power series at random on these subballs. And then you could take a finer covering by smaller balls, and you specify power series at random on those. The full space of locally analytic functions is the direct limit of those um, spaces. For any fixed covering, the family of locally analytic functions on that given covering is a Banach space. I mean, if the underlying space is compact, because you have finitely many balls, so you have finitely many Tate algebras, and the functions relative to that covering is somehow this di direct sum of these finitely many Tate algebras, and you give that the soup norm, and that's again a Banach space. But as you take finer and finer coverings, you get Banach spaces, which are sums of more and more Tate algebras, and when you pass to the limit, you get a direct limit of Banach spaces. And the direct limit topology on a, on a space like that is um, not any more functions. You can't test closeness of functions just by looking at their values. Okay, that's no longer uh, a measure of closeness. So in the Tate algebra, essentially the Gauss norm being the same as the soup norm kind of says two functions are the same if their values are close together. But in this big direct limit, if you want to compare two functions, you have to first put them on a common covering by balls where they're e the two functions that you have are each given by power series on this same family of balls. And then relative to that fixed covering, you have to look at the coefficients of the power series and ask if they're close. Okay, So this is a, a different uh, topology than um, you would expect. So for example, the locally analytic functions are dense in the continuous function. But um, if, you look at the if you look at the locally, whoops, the locally constant functions inside the locally analytic functions, and you ask, the locally constant functions are actually closed in the locally analytic function. And the topology on the locally constant functions is just the, um, the topology which, which rep I mean, the locally, the, where you look at it as a, just a direct limit of finite dimensional vector space. So it's, there's, a, there's a big gap between these locally analytic functions and, say, the continuous functions. So I just emphasize here, you, you have to keep these two pictures straight, right? If you look, for example, I mean, I'm going to be looking at P1 a lot. That seems to be you know, a theme here. If you look at P1 as a locally analytic manifold, then it's just a big collection of balls with some relation you know, that says which balls are contained in which other ones. 
And the locally analytic functions are just, you just specify power series that converge on some collection of balls. And it's the opposite of connected, okay? It's totally disconnected uh, because you have all the locally constant functions in there. If you look at it as a rigid analytic manifold, then the only glo global functions on it are constants, okay? So these are kind of at extreme opposite ends. Now, as I mentioned, this, uh, this space of locally analytic functions on a compact uh, locally analytic manifold is a direct limit of these Banach spaces. And once again, this property of compact transition maps comes into play. You may recall from the very first lecture, whenever that was, three weeks ago or yesterday or something, uh, the, this played a role in the, in the Frechet spaces, which were the functions on the upper half plane. Now, and that was a projective limit. And now we have a direct limit with compact transition maps. And this is maybe a topological hint that there might be some relationship between the two pictures, because it's a general theorem in piatic functional analysis that if you take a direct limit of Banach spaces where the, compact, where the transition maps are compact, so that's called a space of compact type, and you take its dual with the strong topology, then you get a Frechet space, which is a projective limit of Banach spaces with compact transition maps. And in fact, you can characterize which spaces you get. There's a categorical duality between prop, I mean, not all Frechet spaces, but the ones which are compact projective limits of Banach spaces and the one, this topological vector spaces, which are direct limits with compact transition maps of Banach spaces. So these spaces are, are dual to one another. So you remember the, the space OX on the upper half plane was reflexive. Take its dual twice, you come back to itself. Well, if you take its dual once, you get one of these compact type direct limits of Banach spaces. By the way, you may know this if you looked at the Mahler expansions. The locally analytic functions on ZP are given by Mahler expansions for functions with some growth conditions on the coefficients. So that's a direct limit of Banach spaces where you, you sort of moderate, modify the growth condition. The dual to that are the functions on the open unit disk which is one of these projective limits. So this is sort of the primitive example of this kind of duality. Now, I introduced these spaces I called the holomorphic discrete series yesterday, and their duals turn out to be what are called the locally analytic principle series. The terminology comes from representation theory, uh, kind of it's inspired by the representation theory of real Lie groups. It's in some ways a good analogy, and in other ways, there's some differences. But this particular construction is very much analogous to the, uh, the situation for real Lie groups. So again, I'm, I'm now in the locally analytic case, and I want to pick a character, I, actually a particular character for this talk. P is the Borel subgroup in GL2. It's the upper triangular matrices. Okay. So you remember that the projective line arises as this homogeneous space, G mod P, for this particular choice of P. So this is a kind of general construction in representation theory. We start with the character of the Borel subgroup, which only involves the diagonal elements. I'm interested in this particular one, where I have an even integer K. I take A over D and raise it to the K over 2 power. So in particular, the diagonal matrices, this character is trivial. And now I want to construct what's called the locally analytic induction of this character. This is the space of locally analytic functions on the group G, which, trans which when elements of the Borel subgroup act on the right, the character pulls out in this way. And this is a representation space for G acting on the left. Now, if you haven't seen these things before, uh, actually, probably you have. You may just not have realized it, that you've seen them before, because you can unwrap this definition. If you remember, I mentioned you can convert projective space into the homogeneous space by identifying a point with homogeneous coordinates A, B. Just pick a matrix that has first column B minus A and take the, that coset of P. And that's the identification between G mod P and projective space. And you can then use this, uh, if you have a function, I mean, elements of this induced representation are just functions on G. So we can restrict them to these matrices, the lower triangular unipotent matrices, and get a function just of the variable x, OK? And if you do that, and by the way, this C an of kk, I'm going to define that in a minute. 
Okay? Right now, you can just think of this as a certain space of functions on K obtained by restricting my locally analytic function on G to these unipotent matrices. Now, what happens when you do this? Well, the function was locally analytic on G, and it pulls back to a locally analytic function on K. It's on, so now, what, what does that mean? I mean, it's actually, this W of X, omega of X, bigger than or equal to N, this is a big ball around zero. So it's locally analytic on any ball around zero. And what happens at infinity? Well, it turns out not to be locally analytic at infinity, but it turns out to have a pole of, a, of order at worst K at infinity, or actually minus K in the way that I've set up the normalization here. So if you take functions on G where, I mean, what happens is the functions on G, they're locally analytic, and the group acts by translation on the left in a nice way. But now you restrict them to this unipotent group. Now you just have a function of one variable, so that's a big advantage. But you pay a price, and the price that you pay is, first of all, it's not uh, analytic at infinity, so you have this pole you have to worry about. And second of all, you've eliminated the symmetry in the picture, so the group no longer acts in an obvious way because you multiply a unipotent matrix by an arbitrary matrix, and you get some matrix, and then you have to convert it back into the standard form. And if you do that, you find this action. So if you, if you think of your function now as being an element of, so it's a locally analytic function on K. It has a Laurent expansion near infinity, which has a pole of at worst order minus K at infinity. And you let the group act by this formula, which should look familiar, right? I mean, it's, it's our, our old friend, uh, the modular form action. Then you get another model for the same representation space. Okay? And in fact, this is where this bz plus d to the k comes from. I mean, this is, if, if you've ever wondered why bz plus d or cz plus d to the k, as some barbarians use, uh, this is somehow an origin for that thing. So this is, act, you, this is an exercise that you can do. It's not, not too hard. So I have this, I just want to emphasize now, Cn of kk is now locally analytic functions on k with a, with the, in the sense that near infinity, they're given by, I mean, for large z, they're given by a power series in 1 over z. But at infinity, the polar part has order at most minus k. And the group acts by this formula determined by k. And you put a topology on this space. I mean, it has one by virtue of coming from the locally analytic functions on G. But how do you tell if two functions are close? Well, they're close if you can cover this space K, which is the affine space, by finitely many balls that are sort of in, in finite, finite regions. And this is a ball around infinity, right? This is everything bigger than something. So it's a ball around infinity. And the rule is that when you restrict your, write your function as a power series on these finitely many balls that are kind of in the finite part of the affine line, and then as a Laurent expansion on the big part, so you have finitely many power series, one of them is a Laurent series, then you compare them coefficient by coefficient. Okay? And if they're close coefficient by coefficient relative to the same covering of this type, then they're close. So um, if you have never seen these before, these are kind of weird spaces. Le it might help to think about the case um, where k is 0. Okay. So if k is 0, then um, I'm not quite sure where I'm supposed to point this. What happens if k is 0 is that you just have the locally analytic functions on p1. I mean, then there's no pole condition, right? So it's got to be analytic at infinity. And this tells you that the group action is just the Mobius transformation. And so the k equals 0 case is just the locally analytic functions on P1. And the group at just acts by pullback by Mobius transformations. OK? And if you change the k, unlike in the rigid, rigid setting, where changing the k didn't affect the space, but it affected the group action, here, changing the k does actually affect the space because it adds poles at infinity. Nothing will happen to you if, if you just think about the k equals 0 case, and you just think locally analytic functions on p1. So I mean, 
if you think about locally analytic functions on P1, then you can see that as a, I mean, even if you kind of have no idea what it means to be a representation, you can still spot some subspaces of this space. So in the, let's think about k equals zero first. You have locally analytic functions on P1. Well, as I mentioned earlier, the locally constant functions on P1 are a closed subspace of that, which is invariant by the group. So you have an obvious, well, first of all, you have the, the constant function, OK? Then you have the locally constant function. And then you have the space itself. So in the general case, where k is less than or equal to zero and even, you have the polynomials of degree bounded by this order of pole at infinity, which is preserved by the group action. You have the space of locally polynomial functions. So what is a locally polynomial function? Well, one way to describe it is you have a covering of P1, and you just put a polynomial on each. Not a, you don't put a whole power series. You just put a polynomial on each disk. That's an interesting space, because on a locally analytic manifold, like take you know, locally analytic functions on, on QP, ask yourself, which functions have derivative 0? Well, I mean, it, it's constant functions, except because of this fact that you can specify the things completely at random on different disks. You don't get globally constant functions. You only get locally constant functions, because you can specify a different, I mean, a, a function which is given by different constants on different disks will have derivative 0. So you actually have the following exact sequence. If you take the, the member k here is negative. This is to make other formulas work out right. But if you take derivatives of these functions, the kernel will be the locally polynomial functions. And the image turns out to be, this is a, you have to prove this, but it turns out to be yet another one of these spaces, but with this 2 minus k uh, put in. So in the k equals 0 case, when you take the locally analytic functions on P1 and take their derivatives, you sort of get the one forms on locally analytic one forms on P1. And the kernel are, the lo this C infinity means locally constant functions. And inside there, you have the constant functions to make this fit in one exact sequence I modded out by that here. So in, in general, this has sort of a, a two-step uh, filtration. And actually, it's a theorem that in the appropriate sense, this is a Jordan-Holder series for these representations. OK, so now I can actually talk about the um, the upper half plane and how the spaces I just defined, which are these locally analytic representation spaces, might conceivably be connected to the spaces on the upper half plane. So the connection is by an integral transform, so which I can define very simply. So um, this OK prime B you remember what O of k is. It's the rigid analytic functions on the upper half plane with a group action that involves k. Prime means take the continuous linear forms on that space. And B means give it the strong topology, the topology of uniform convergence on bounded sets. If you don't care about that, you could just say, OK, forget what the topology is. I mean, you can still get a fair ways without worrying about the topology. Now, suppose we have an element of that space, so it's a linear form on functions on the upper half plane. I'm going to make a function on k out of it. Namely, I'm going to take, for x in k, I'm going to take 1 over z minus x. This is a function on the upper half plane. And I'm going to evaluate lambda on it and get a number. And I think of that as a function of x. Okay. So for instance, if I evaluate, if x is 0, I take 1 over z. That's a perfectly good function on the upper half plane. Because its pole, remember, at 0 is exactly the thing which is missing from the upper half plane. And so I get a number. And so this at least is a well-defined function. Okay, It may have no properties, but it's a well-defined function. And the theorem is that if k is even, and actually it's true even if k is odd, I avoided, I probably keep saying this because I feel kind of bad about it, I avoided odd k just because I didn't want to take square roots of p, which you would have to do. Anyway, for even k bigger than or equal to 2, excuse me, you get this map is actually a, a G invariant topological isomorphism between this dual space. And here we have this space of locally analytic functions whose poles are of the appropriate order at infinity 
modded out by this global space of polynomials. So if k is uh, 2, on this side we have O of 2, which is the one forms on the piatic upper half plane. And on this side we have 2 minus k is 0. So this would be the analytic func locally analytic functions on P1 modulo constants. Okay, so the dual to the one forms on the piatic upper half plane are the locally analytic functions on the boundary modulo constants. Okay, so measures, uh, and if you want, because ref of reflexivity, if you like, you could say that measures on locally analytic functions on the boundary are given by rigid analytic functions in the interior. So this is a boundary values result. So I'm going to outline why this is true. I mean, stated this way, it looks maybe completely mysterious, but. So the easy thing to check is the G invariance, um, at least for k equals 2. It, it's not hard to do for the higher weight case, too. But what happens? We have to plug in how everything acts. So you have to remember how G acts both on the functions on the upper half plane and on this CN KK space. So, oops, I'm missing a, there should be a big, per, that, that should be a, there's a, a, a backslash right missing from that or something. Anyway, if you work this out, this is what you get. And if you play around with it for a while, namely you substitute, I guess you do something like, sub, you write x as x minus z, as z minus x, or you maybe write z as z minus x plus x or something clever like that, then you find that this rational function in here splits apart. Put it in partial fractions, I believe is the technical term. You get 1 over z minus x minus b over bz plus d. And the point is, this you recognize as our integral transform without the g's. And this has no s's. OK? So I mean, it's a, as far as um, lambda is concerned, it's independent of x. So it's a constant function, which we modded out by. OK? So, you get this congruence here. So therefore, this group action, that's why you have to mod out, basically, by the constants, is because of this term. So you get a, a, a g-equivariant map. And if you do this in higher weight case, instead of getting this thing, you get some polynomial. That's why you have to mod out by the polynomial. It's exercise for maple. Or you could do it by hand, I suppose. But. OK, so now what do you have to show? Um, you have to show that. Next, that this function that you've constructed is locally analytic. I mean, that would be a good place to start. So um, how do you tell if it's locally analytic? Well, first of all, remember that this, the thing we started with lambda is a continuous linear form. And what does continuous mean? It basically means that it factors through one of the Banach spaces, one of the affinoid algebras, for which O is the projective limit. That's kind of a topological fact. That's what the projective limit topology means. So to give a continuous linear form, we actually have a linear form on one of these affinoid algebras coming from, remember xn is gotten by deleting disks of some particular radius. So uh, the strategy here, and I'll show you a picture about this in a minute, is that uh, we look at this oxn, and it was gotten by deleting a bunch of disks, right? And those disks are in K, where we are trying to make our function. So what we're going to do, at least, is to look at this disk. This is the disk of radius where the valuation is bigger than or equal to n minus 1. This is one of the disks you cut out of P1 to make xn minus. And we want x to actually lie in this part of K, and we'll show that it's analytic there. And then if you, so here's a picture, right? Out here, this is the piatic upper half plane. And z is out here. So z is big. And x is a variable on the boundary. So x has to be in here, where it has to be small. OK? I mean, this is one picture. And now, we're interested in 1 over z minus x. But z is big and x is small, so we expand it in a geometric series, which will converge. OK? So now we can look at this. 1 over x to the i, one, this, this sum here, and see what happens when we apply a continuous linear form, which, remember, only cares about the z variable, not the x variable, to this power series. Well, this looks pretty hideous. This is my expansion here. 
if you work through what the various spaces are, which is what these estimates tell you, so this says x is small and z is big. So this power series converges. So for fixed x, this is actually an, a rigid function in this affinoid algebra. So we can apply lambda to it. And lambda is continuous, so we can move it through the sum. And if we do move it through the sum, remember it doesn't care about x. x is kind of a constant. So we get lambda applied to these powers of z. And if you work through the fact that lambda was continuous, which gives you bounds on lambda of z to the i in terms of the norm of z to the i in this Bonnock space, and plug everything back in, you find that this does actually converge on this disk. Okay? So what we've shown is that if lambda factors through the affinoid algebra gotten by deleting disks of a certain radius, that lambda applied to this 1 over z minus x, viewed as a function of x, is actually locally analytic on the covering that corresponds to the deleted disks in the limit set. So the, the key idea is really just the geometric series. And if you want to do the other, you, you have a group action here. In fact, this is sufficient because you can permute everything around by the group action if you want. Whoop. Ooh. Is that? Yeah. So um, now we wanted to know, I mean, I claimed it was a topological isomorphism. So to, to show that, it's enough to show that it is continuous and bijective because then you can apply an open mapping theorem to conclude that it's a, um, that's fortunate. Otherwise, I think it would be difficult to prove that it's a homeomorphism. But um, why, is it in, why is it continuous? That I'm just going to skip. It's not deep. It just involves checking the definitions of the uh, to various topologies on both sides. What about injectivity? Well, you have to remember this ik of lambda of x is 1 over z minus x. So what happens as x goes to infinity? Well, 1 over z minus x goes to 0. Okay? So in particular, the function that you get here is 0 at infinity. So it doesn't have any poles or anything. It just is 0. So in particular, it can't meet this subspace because the polynomials are most definitely not 0 at infinity. Okay? So you can, in you can instead of viewing it this way, you can think about this map as factoring through the subspace of this of functions which are actually 0 at infinity. And if the image were 0, then it would actually have to be 0 everywhere, including at infinity. And if you work through how the, uh, if you look back at our geometric series, to get 0 here, you would have to be 0 basically on all functions of this form, because they come up in the geometric series. And those turn out to be dense in the full space. So if, this, if your lambda of x were 0, it has to vanish on so many rational functions that it actually has to be 0. Okay, so that's where the, con the uh, injectivity comes from. So how do you show that it's surjective? Well, the way you show that it's surjective is almost by just constructing an inverse. And the technique that you use to construct an inverse is to use what's called the residue map. So now, the, I mean, so far the, the upper half plane, you haven't, the geometry of the upper half plane has not really played a role, but now it comes back. Now the tree comes back into the picture. And this residue map construction um, is the key. So what's the idea? Well, you remember that if you take an edge in the tree and you look at the inverse image of the reduction map, you get this affinoid, uh, sorry, this annulus. It's an admissible annulus. And what are the rigid functions on such an annulus? Well, there are sort of double-ended Laurent series, and there's a condition on the power on the coefficients which make them converge on the two ends. I mean, you can work out what it has to be. They, they can. It's actually a fairly complicated condition because of the fact that it's open at both ends. But there's some growth condition on these coefficients to make it converge. Now. If I think of this not as a function but as a one form, I can take the coefficient of dz over z and call that the residue on this annulus. And it's, it's a fact that, I mean, this so far is not very canonical because I can pick a different function z, right, for which this annulus is still, let's say, u. It's still isomorphic to the u's between 0 and 1 by some analytic automorphism. 
But it turns out that even if I do that, this residue number is unaffected. The only thing that can affect this residue number is if I chose instead of if my new parameter, instead of somehow, I mean, if, for instance, take P over Z, OK? That also identifies the annulus as between 0 and 1, but somehow the other way around. I mean, it's big where, P, where Z is small and small where Z is big. And that would have the effect of, making, of changing the sign of the residue. So the residue map is a function on the edges which um, is sensitive to the orientation of the edge, but other than up, up to sign. But other than that is a well-defined invariant. And so we get a function on all edges using the group action. Namely, you pull, if you have a function on an edge E, or meaning on the, on the annulus that corresponds to that edge, you just use the group to pull it back to the standard edge where you have this annulus, and you expand it as a power series like this, and you pull out the coefficient C minus 1. And this is a well-defined operation. Uh, if you chose different Gs that, had this, that did this, right? You might, this G isn't well defined. There's a lot of choices for this G. But they give Zs which are related by analytic uh, isomorphisms. And so they would give the same residue. The only catch being that you, this is, these are oriented edges. You want to make sure you preserve the orientation of the edge. So by construction, it's G equivariant. And this is this fact. If you reverse the edge, you get the opposite residue. The real theorem to be proved is this fact, that if you take this, uh, pick a vertex and you look at the edges leaving that vertex in the tree and you take the sum of the residues around that vertex, you get 0. So this is what's called a harmonic function on the tree. And this is kind of the residue theorem for rigid analysis. Um, uh, I mean, I'm not going to say anything about how you prove it. It's not, but it's a standard. Uh, result from one-dimensional rigid analysis that if you have one of these domains in P1, that the sum of the residues around these boundary annuli is always 0 for a 1 form. So using these residues, we are going to construct an inverse map. So what does that mean? We have a function in this space on the uh, functions on the boundary. And we need to find a continuous linear map on the rigid functions, which if we apply it to 1 over z minus x, gives us our function back. OK, that's basically what we have to do. And how do you do that? Well, you have your function. Let's just look at this at the Gauss point. I mean, this is the basic idea. So suppose you're, fun you're just given a locally, this is the piece of the locally analytic function, which converges on the disk of radius one around zero. Okay? So that's one of the functions in this space. Here it is. There's some convergence condition on the BJs. They go to zero, basically, periodically. Now I'm going to make this linear form. So there's a dot there. That means lambda of f is the sum. I use the BJs from my uh, function f. And I replace the x to the j's by z to the j dz. And then I stick the f in there. And I take the sum of those residues. So this is, it turns out, a continuous linear form. And um, what I'm going to show you is that if you now apply the integral transform to that continuous linear form, you get the function f back. OK? That's what you have to show. And it, once again, it's the geometric series. So if you look at z to the j over z minus x, and you expand it as a power series, remember, x lies in this disk. And z lies in the annulus u. So there are two possibilities. Well, I mean, I should say, there are really two possibilities here. You have an annulus in projective space, and then it has an inside ball and an outside ball. Okay. And we're, we're trying to reconstruct the function, which is f on the inside ball and 0 on the outside ball. Okay. That's what we're trying to do. So we have to compute. So the, the point is, if we look at z to the j over z minus x, when um, x is in the inside ball, then z is bigger than x, and you get the geometric series going this way. But when x is in the outside ball, because remember, z is trapped in this annulus in the middle. So if x is in the outside ball, then x is bigger than z, and you get the geometric series going the other way, with the x's in the denominators. Okay, 
So if you think about my picture from earlier, you remember x was inside, z was outside. Now you have to think z is trapped in an annulus, and there's another ball on the other side where x can be. So you have these two possibilities. Now what happens when you take the residues? Well, remember the residue is the coefficient of dz over z. All the z's here are in the numerator. So you never, if you multiply by a power of z and take the residue, you never get anything. But here you have z's in the denominator, and basically you get, what do you get? x, you, you're looking for the minus 1 situation, so you're getting, that happens when i is equal to j. Okay? So when x is in the inside part, and you apply that lambda function to this geometric series, you pull out precisely the bj's x to the j's. But when x is in the uh, other side, you get 0. OK? So it works. Um, so this, and then if you take into account the group action and so forth, you can show that if you have an arbitrary one of these locally analytic functions on the boundary, by choosing the correct combination of these residues, you can reconstruct that function as the image of a linear form. So it's surjective, and therefore, by this open mapping theorem, you have this topological isomorphism. Now, I wrote the map going from the dual of this to this space. But it's an isomorphism, right? So you can also dualize it. Both spaces are reflexive. If you look at the map going the other direction, you get something that looks kind of like the Poisson integral. So here, mu is a distribution on this space. It's a linear form on that space. So in this picture here, I'm thinking of what z is now a point in the upper half plane, OK? And x is the variable. And as I integrate x, I get a function on the, uh, of z, which is on the upper half plane. And that turns out to be the transpose of this map, OK? So uh, you can go back and forth between functions on the upper half plane and distributions on the boundary. So what's, how does this fit into this, this picture of Morita duality? So we can express the fact by saying that if you pick an even integer k bigger than or equal to 2, you have a, uh, a, uh, a pairing of topological vector spaces here. I mean, you can compute it either way. I mean, if you have an f here, then it, you can think of it as a distribution on this space, which you can then evaluate. Or if you have a function here, you can think of it as a distribution on this space and evaluate. Either one you want. It's the same. And uh, that's a g-equivariant by continuous duality. Now, um, it contains a lot of information in it because remember, just to remind you, take k equals 2. This is like the locally analytic functions on p1 mod constants. And this is the one forms on the upper half space. Each of those spaces have interesting subspaces. Here you have the locally constant functions, the k equals 2 k's. And here you have the, if, it, if you think of this as the one forms, you have the exact forms and the Duram cohomology. So you might want more information about this whole picture as to how the, um, the different subspaces are related under this duality. And so that you can get by looking a little more closely at what's going on. And I just want to, in order to do that, go back to the residue map and just remind you in a little bit more generality what you got. So now we can just take an arbitrary abelian group. To talk about an, a harmonic co-cycle on the tree is one of these functions which takes, value, which, which takes an edge of x, an oriented edge of x, and gives you a number. And it has these two properties that we saw for the residue map, namely, it changes sign if you reverse the edge, and the net inflow or outflow from any vertex is 0. Those are called the harmonic functions or the harmonic cocycles on the tree. And I'm going to let C har of m be the space of such functions. OK. So we have a map, the residue map, namely, given a function in O of k, we can, take, we can make a function here a harmonic function taking values in the dual space to the space of polynomials. Here's the definition of it. Given my function on the upper half plane and an edge and a polynomial, I take the residue of the polynomial times f times dz. So it's always good to think about the k equals 2 case, 
then this is just hom k k, so it's just constants. So then we have constant valued harmonic functions on the tree, and this is just the value of the harmonic function associated to a function on the upper half plane on an edge is just the residue of f d z on that edge. Okay? So this is the residue map, and it's uh, g equivariant. So it gives us a map to these harmonic functions. Now, the integral transform identified this space here, this space with the du dual space to these locally analytic functions on the boundary. And if you remember, inside here, LA, by the way, stands for locally algebraic. This is not my terminology, but it seems to have become popular. Locally algebraic is what I call locally polynomial. So take k equals 2. This is then locally analytic functions on P1 modulo constants. This is locally constant functions on P1 modulo constants. And this map is restriction. Uh, sorry, is induced by, I mean, it's, it's, it's on the dual space. So if you have a linear form that you can evaluate on locally analytic functions, you can just instead restrict it and evaluate it on locally constant functions. Okay? And the claim here is that this diagram commutes. Namely, the residues tell you how to integrate locally polynomial functions. Now, I guess I'm out of time. I have a picture, I think, here. We'll do this next time. So I think I should probably just stop here. Thank you. <laughs>